There have been a lot of game plans tried over the years to slow down Tom Brady, some obviously more successful than others. A few defenses have rushed with only four guys and gambled that they could get there in time, while others have relentlessly blitzed him with five or six rushers and gambled that their secondary could hold up long enough. Some coaches have tried zone coverages, and some have tried man coverages, but in the end, most of those plans failed on their own. In fact, the only teams that have managed to slow down the Patriots over the years were the teams that didn't use any one of those philosophies. You see, believe it or not, the key to beating down Brady isn't just to constantly blitz or to never blitz or to play lots of man or lots of zone. The key to beating the greatest quarterback ever is to do all of those things in the same game. And then once you do eventually find something tricky that works, never, ever do it again. The Patriots offense is a very unique machine that nobody else around the league has been truly able to replicate. Most offensive coordinators will give a play call based on personnel grouping, down, distance, score, clock, and of course the experience level of their quarterback, and a lot of the time those QBs will also have a secondary play call that they can switch to depending on whatever they read from the defense before the snap. New England, though, is different. It doesn't matter what their personnel grouping is or what the down and distance is or what the situation is, Tom Brady has the authority to turn any play at the line of scrimmage into any other play in the entire book just by using one word or hand signal. Every single player on that offense knows the whole route tree and the whole system, even down to the fullback, and Brady will not hesitate to completely morph Josh McDaniel's play call to his liking based on whatever he's seeing from the defense. Playing against a shapeless, formless, non-identifiable offense like this one is a different kind of challenge, and because of that it requires a different kind of approach if you want to stop it. So as Super Bowl Sunday inches closer, I went in search of some lessons that the Rams can learn from to help them shut down this machine. And to do that, I looked at the game plans of the 2018 Titans and Steelers, who both had great days against New England, as well as a game plan from Wade Phillips himself from back in his Denver days. All of those successful defensive performances used different personnel packages, different coverages, and different pressures, so there was no singular formula as far as any of those aspects are concerned. But they all did share a few key common philosophies that are way more important in the grand scheme of things. Number one, they all use Brady's problem-solving tendencies against him, especially when he spread them out on third downs to get a clearer picture of the defense. Number two, they made him hold the ball just a hair longer by changing the coverage after the snap and slowing down his reads. And number three, and this is perhaps the most important one of all, they tried not to use the same tricks too many times before he picked up on them and found their weaknesses. Or at least, keyword, tried on that last one. The Steelers got caught with their hand in the cookie jar a little bit late in that game, but I'll get to that mistake later. Let's start with the first point on that list, using Brady's own problem-solving tendencies against him. Tom has a very particular way that he operates before and after the snap within this system, and it's one that's driven defenses crazy for almost two decades now. But if you know how he thinks, you can prepare for all of the aces that he keeps stored up his sleeve. Take this third down stop by the Titans back in week 10 as an example. It's third and four, just outside of field goal range, and Tennessee is showing straight up cover one with a five-man rush. But there's a bit of a wrinkle in there because there are three inside linebackers on the field. Usually, if you've got three inside backers on the field on third down against only one tight end, at least one of those backers is probably blitzing, because there's no other reason why the defense would employ that kind of personnel package in this situation. That being said though, all three of them are standing up and lined up fairly ambiguously, so Brady isn't quite sure who's rushing and who's dropping. That's why all these linebackers are on the field in the first place actually, because it creates an issue for the quarterback trying to keep track of all these moving parts that can be used in multiple ways. So, to try to solve that problem, Brady gives a hard count which draws Jayon Brown up towards the line of scrimmage, which seeing that from Brady's perspective, he probably saw that as a tip that Brown was blitzing. Ironically, Brown was not blitzing and he was actually just coming up to aggressively meet James White in coverage and potentially jump a screen pass, but Brady didn't know that yet. Based on the hard count, he read blitz, and usually when Brady reads a blitz up the middle with no other defenders there to cover that void in the middle of the field, that's the area where he and his receivers typically attack. Remember, this offense is based on morphing plays and routes on the fly. If Brady reads blitz, his receivers also need to read blitz and fill that void as the hot receiver, because no matter what, that ball is going to be out quick regardless of whatever the initial play design was. 
And more importantly, from a defender's perspective, they've also got to be ready for Brady to attack that area in under two seconds in order to answer their blitz. That's just how he thinks, and that's how he has always solved that problem. And they need to be aware of that tendency so that they can jump it. And Kevin Byard thankfully understood that tendency well enough to be all over this hot route by Jacob Hollister from the beginning. Right before the ball is snapped, you can even see him kind of cheating up and fully expecting Hollister to release quickly in either direction, and as soon as he reads that bullet slant, he's looking for the ball. He gets his hand in there, he breaks up the pass, and now they're off the field without giving up any points. That's a safety that understands the quarterback he's playing against. That's a guy who's watched Brady answer enough blitzes to know what to look for, and it paid off with a crucial third down stop and a forced punt, which then led to the Titans taking a 17 point lead late in the third quarter. When you're playing against the Patriots offense, you're not just facing a quarterback, you're facing one of the best brains the sport has ever seen and you have to understand how that brain works. Brady can answer any test you throw at him if you make it easy, so just don't make it easy. Mix up your coverages, mix up your rushes, make pressures harder to read by moving people around and dropping bodies that he doesn't expect to be dropped. Roll safeties across the field at the last second and switch between match zones and spot drop zones. Bracket Julian Edelman inside and out and take away those two-way option routes. Just whatever you do, don't let Brady trust his pre-snap read and try to slow down that brain as much as possible after the snap. And that brings me back to the second point on my list, which is switch up your coverages on the fly to make Brady hold the ball. I came across a great example of this when I was studying one of the last times that a Wade Phillips defense went against Brady all the way back in the 2015 AFC Championship game. This was another third down, third and 15 to be exact, and once again we see Brady using his usual pre-snap tricks to try to figure out the defense. He's got James White flexed all the way out wide to give him a picture of what's going on, and because he sees Aqib Tlaib, a cornerback, out there to meet him, that's a red flag for his own defense. If it were a safety or a linebacker, that would signal man, but because Tlaib is there, Brady is thinking that this is either cover two or cover four because he sees those two safeties sitting there deep. As White motions back inside to flank Brady in the backfield, you can see the secondary shift around to get into a more defined cover four look. And the thing that you need to understand about how cover four is played is that past 10 yards from the line of scrimmage, these safeties are both essentially in man coverage against the number two receivers inside, whether they be slot receivers, tight ends, running backs, anybody. Whoever is the second receiver in from the boundary, that's the safety's responsibility in a cover four. And on any long developing route down the field, that safety will be on him regardless of whatever direction he breaks. Similarly, the corners outside will be responsible for the outside receivers deep down the field, regardless of whatever direction they break as well. So knowing that, the Patriots actually have a pretty good play call here against cover four, a deep curls concept, because it exploits the one-on-one -on -one that they think they're getting with Danny Amendola and the safety. If Danny releases hard off the line and acts like he's trying to get vertical either for a go route or maybe a post, that is naturally going to back this safety off because he doesn't want to get beat over the top with nobody to help him out. At which point Amendola just has to slam on the brakes right at the first down marker and catch the pass in rhythm as he turns. If it's timed correctly, the safety that was giving all of that cushion in a one-on-one -on -one scenario will basically have no shot to recover and break it up. So overall this is a really good call against this coverage. However, the Broncos are not actually in cover four. As the ball is being snapped, they change the picture, and now Denver's in a cover three with one safety rolling over the top to the deep middle and the other dropping down to that hook zone underneath. So now look at what Tom sees as he's at the top of his drop. A zone defender staring right at him and daring him to throw that curl for an easy interception, and all across the field there's no receivers open at or beyond the sticks because of that shift in coverage. He has to hold the ball and try to buy time while he scans the whole field, and nearly six seconds after the ball is snapped, he takes a sack. Now, six seconds of holding the ball might as well be a year by NFL standards, but by Tom Brady standards, that's an eternity. This was a coverage sack all the way because Brady never, ever holds the ball that long, and the reason why the coverage was so effective was because they deceived Brady with a late roll with the safeties and slowed down his read. I've said it before and I'll say it again, you cannot give him a clear picture of your defense. You have to muddy the waters and make him hold it because with how damn slow he is, he's not going to get away from you as a runner. His only weapon for neutralizing a good pass rush is his release time, not his mobility, so if you lengthen that release time by throwing weird looks at him, you can really help out your pass rush. 
However, and this is a very big however, when you are throwing all these crazy coverage switches at Tom, you have to make sure not to overuse them, because if you use the same look enough times, then it becomes easy to read again and he'll go right back to picking you apart. That's actually number three on the list, by the way, and I'll use this sequence of plays from the Pittsburgh game earlier this year as an example. The Steelers are in a dime personnel grouping here in the red zone in what looks to be a fairly standard cover three alignment before the snap. You've got a linebacker over Josh Gordon in the slot and a cornerback out wide on James White. So again, this is most likely zone and with a single high safety in the middle, it's looking a lot like cover three. The Patriots are calling that old faithful vertical double seam concept that we've looked at several times on this show over the last couple months. And if you've learned anything from the film room over the years, it's that double seam concepts absolutely murder cover three. It's one of the best calls you can make against that coverage, honestly, but as you might have expected, it's not actually cover three, and the Steelers do the right thing by changing up the look after the snap. Watch them invert this coverage essentially to a Tampa 2 zone with both of those deep safeties now sitting on those seam routes and a robber sitting underneath them to undercut anything thrown to that soft spot in the middle. The throws to both Gordon and Hogan are certainly makeable if they were thrown perfectly and led high and inside where only they could get them, but because Tom was slowed down in his read by the switch in coverage, he just didn't see them in time before the rush got home. And again, without any mobility whatsoever, his only weapon at neutralizing a pass rush like this is to get that ball out quickly and decisively. Once the Steelers got in the backfield, he couldn't get away, and he unwisely threw it up for grabs where Joe Hayden came down with the pick. So again, making Brady think for an extra beat and hold the ball is key, and switching up coverages is how you do that. But what you don't want to do is show the same switches enough to the point where Brady gets used to seeing that same look over and over. That roll to Tampa 2 was used probably three or four times before that interception throughout the game, all in long yarded situations from dime personnel. So by the time New England's two minute drill came around at the end of the fourth quarter and the Steelers showed that look yet again, Tom had seen all he needed to see and he was waiting for it. In fact, Brady was counting on the Steelers going back to that well once again, and that predictability led to this huge 34 yard gain to Julian Edelman. As soon as Morgan Burnett went to the middle of the field on the motion, both Edelman and Brady knew they had him. It was the same spot he went to every time he bailed to a deep zone. But more importantly, because he always bailed from such a shallow alignment, he always had to completely open up his hips toward the boundary and run at a full sprint to get deep. Because of that desperate sprint deep, he was almost never looking at Brady or looking at the middle of the field like a normal safety would be doing in Tampa 2, so the deep middle was actually more vulnerable than it usually would be just because of that little wrinkle. Down in the red zone earlier when things were very compressed and there wasn't much room to work deep, that opening didn't show up as much. But here, with tons of green grass to work with and no end zone to restrict space, Edelman had all the freedom in the world to just stem the route back inside of Burnett when he wasn't looking and slip in behind that robber zone over the middle. Again, in a normal Tampa 2 alignment, a seam route like this would never work because the safety would be staring down the quarterback and waiting for it. But when you roll to that coverage in the way that Pittsburgh did, it's wide open and New England knew that it would be. They had seen it enough all game to come up with this way to answer that coverage, and they made sure that Brady had time to sit in the pocket and launch it deep to that spot with extra protection from Gronkowski and White. This right here is the biggest and most important lesson that the Rams can learn from watching tape on successful defenses against the Patriots. Just because something works once or twice doesn't mean it's gonna work a third time. If you land one combo of punches and rock Brady a bit, that's great. But don't throw that combo again, because if you do, he's going to read it, counter it, and knock your ass out. The Steelers managed to survive in that game, but only barely, and Wade Phillips would be wise to learn from their mistake. In fact, there's a lot of mistakes that Phillips can learn from, even some that he's made himself along the way against this same quarterback. But if there was one defensive coordinator in the league that I would trust to give Tom a run for his money, it's Wade. He, more than almost anybody else, knows that this matchup is not about the talent level on either side of the field, but rather about how that talent is used. It's about who comes up with the best plan of attack and who does the best job at disguising that plan until the very last second. When you go against the Patriots, your speed, strength, and overall freakishness don't matter nearly as much as your discipline, toughness, and intelligence. To be honest, very rarely are the Pats ever the most talented team on the field, but they are almost always the smartest. So if I'm the Rams, I'm not directly game planning for Julian Edelman's quickness or Gronk's size or the versatility of their running backs. Those things are all problems in the background. I'm game planning for the quarterback and how he sees the field. Because at the end of the day, if you slow down Tom, you slow down the whole offense. And if you slow down the offense, you win the game. 
With one week left to go, that is a very simple equation that is now in front of the Rams to solve. I don't know what they're going to do about it, but I certainly know what I would do if I was in their position. Don't worry about being better. Tennessee, Pittsburgh, and once upon a time Denver were not better than the Patriots. But on those special Sundays, they sure as hell were smarter. Thank you so much for watching this week's episode, the 100th episode of The Film Room, believe it or not. I truly cannot believe how far this show has come in the last few years, and I, I never imagined that this channel would be where it is today. And the biggest part of all of that success is, of course, you guys. The Patreon donors, the subscribers, the commenters, all of you. I wouldn't be able to do this show without you, and I wouldn't be able to do it and support myself without my sponsors either, because all of you obviously know that California is an outrageously expensive place to live. So I would also like to thank MyBookie as well for sponsoring me literally the whole season long. That was a huge deal for me and for the channel, and hopefully a huge deal for you guys as well, because I know a lot of you, just based on the emails and the tweets and the comments I've seen, you guys made a pretty good amount of money on MyBookie this year as well. So I kind of feel like that partnership worked out for everyone in the best sort of way. So again, thank you all to everyone for watching and subscribing and supporting both me and my sponsors so that they keep coming back. And here's to another 100 episodes. I'll see you guys all again next week, and until then, later. Later.